Lu Ming Kang, thanks very much indeed for joining us today. And looking at the third plenum in China and its implications, people have talked about what the economic implications are, but what do you see it in terms of practice, the practical reforms that you see arising in the next few years and the road ahead? Yeah, uh, in general, I think uh, uh, you know, the Chinese people are now they are very excited about uh, the outcomes of from the party, you know, Congress, the third plenary, because the first of its kind in Chinese history. We mentioned what is the goal of our further reform and opening up. The goal is brand new. We talked about state governance. We must build up a mechanism and institutional system for better governance in China. To realize that goal, then we, we have the confidence by the end of the day, by year 2020, we can do something for the public interest. This broad thrust is, as you say, historical. What do you see as the practical steps going forward to actually meet that dream, if you like? Yeah, uh, work already starts. Uh, the good news came that uh, the government officials at the layers and tiers in China are rechecking their thoughts in which area we got to retreat, okay? In, in, in which way we must be slimming and uh, how we can be slimmer. And in, uh, that is the good news. So they cut off a lot of formalities to go uh, uh, for, uh, you know, for approval uh, of uh, certain projects or doing the business in China. So that's a very good uh, signal to start with. And also, uh, and in the legislature areas, people are changing the rules and the laws and to make sure that in the future, the enforcement mechanism will be more independent, the, get the, the distance with the localities. What attracts my eyes is uh, the Lula land reform. We have 15% of the total land in the Lula areas are uh, belonging to the called collective ownership, which uh, you can never define who is the real owner. <laughs> and uh, which is no good uh, uh, and uh, make full use of the resources like that. So in the future, they said that they will lift the cap and it, they will enjoy the same status as the land in the urban areas. I met a fisherman in the countryside. He got to 200 he Chinese he uh, hectares and uh, it's a huge uh, you know, fishing farm over there. And they, he built a five-story, you know, the house for him, three in the village. He said, I will keep one at hand to live with. That's my accommodation residential house. And the rest of I can leave to the Lula co-ops who can loan my money. But they said no, because uh, uh, whatever you have in the countryside, it can't be used as collateral, so no money, no collaterals, no money. <laughs> so in the future, that will be a landscape change. What do you really see as being underpinning the kind of reforms that you're talking about, both at a, an individual level and as well as at a national level? Is it going to be the marketplace yeah. or is it going to be the government? Yeah, I, I, both ways. I think the reform and the restructure of the roads paid by government is very essential because the government still plays a very important role in each country worldwide. And even we are following the market economy, market economy could fail from time to time. If the market fails, it's a panic. So the government got to pay its limited roles and make sure that they are doing their homework in the future. And in the market side, I can think individuals, as you mentioned, and to the corporate levels, they must, uh, you know, s s build up the self-consciousness in implementing the corporate the social 
like uh, responsibilities, and they must uh, do like, some contributions for social inclusiveness. I don't think uh, people will be always happy along the course of reform and opening up. Uh, we will be facing uh, uh, some challenges, uh, maybe if not a lot of them, because you know if we want to reform our price mechanism, so from time to time you can see if a market had with a final say of the price, then prices will be going up and down, you know, and according to the market needs and demands, and it will heavily impact upon your life individual and the corporate. So uh, people got to learn how to be ready for such a changes. But anyway, in long run, I think it's a government role in you know the cultivating in cultivation of the public that the costs and the pains along the paths of further reform and opening up is objectively uh, you know, over there, with us, is always with us. But if you do not do that, you will be suffering with the costs and pains even larger. It may be a big jump from, I think, probably a, a personalized view to a corporate view, but where do you see banking going in China? It seems to have had a good name and a bad name, depending on where it, one happens to have been and with which institutions you happen to have had done business with, perhaps. But how do you see the reform of the banking system going up? I think in the past 10 years, uh, we're facing a lot of criticism about the rose pay the Chinese banks. But uh, what I should say, we have made conspicuous progress in that regard. If you talk with uh, you know, the professional people in, in financial industries everywhere, they acknowledge the achievements uh, in the past 10 years because we draw a full stop for you know, SOE banks, okay? Uh, we turned and restructured all the SOE banks to the stockholding companies and they put them a floating on the capital market. So in, to increase their information disclosure requirements, raise the bars, and also to increase their transparency. 10 years ago and 15 years, the people have absolutely no knowledge about money laundry and the terror financing. And the, so that is, has been deeply embedded in the everyday risk management nowadays. And uh, government put a lot of effort, efforts to help the Chinese banks to move to today's situation. On the flip side of coin, having said that, I must say, the, it's not enough. The, the work can never stop here, and the, you should move forward, further diversify your ownership, and the, uh, further to learn more from your peers in uh, uh, Globe Don't be uh, proud and complacency is the biggest enemy. I think in the future, banking institution in China got to move forward continuously and uh, hopefully it could be at a, a most, m much faster pace. We have to do that. Uh, uh, some stories embedded here is that um, SOE uh, financing, uh, a lot of dissatisfactions in the markets, but honestly speaking, uh, SOE financing, you can never rely upon the banking industry. Uh, uh, we must boost VC venture capital in China, and we must arm ourselves with qualified PEs, uh, 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 the private equity companies, and in the future, for some uh, medium-sized enterprises which are not economically viable, or are facing the overcapacity issue, which has come on in China and the other Asian countries. And uh, we need buyout funds to help them instead of relying upon the banking. Banking, the every penny of the money, almost all the pennies, are coming from depositors. 
they got to be careful and cautious to help, you know, risky borrowers. And so that's the reason why we got to develop the special boards on capital markets and so on and so forth. That's the reason why we got to push forward the reform to liberalize our interest rate to make sure that we have a sound and a deep capital market to help those SOEs and to bank all those poor guys who should be banked with the financial community. Ming Kang, thank you very much indeed for joining us.